It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Amanda Condon, who I've known for many, many years. She's a very uh, wonderful person to to work with. Um, Dr. Amanda Condon practices comprehensive rural family medicine in Notre Dame de la Notre Dame du Lorraine, Manitoba. She also supports Charleswood Care Center, a long-term care facility in Winnipeg. In addition to her clinical work, Dr. Co uh, Kodan serves as an associate professor with the Department of Family Medicine, Max Ratty College of Medicine at the University of Manitoba, with a commitment to family medicine education and supporting medical learners. She proudly champions joy in work and interprofessional collaboration as foundational to excellence in primary care. Since 2019, she has served as the associate dean, postgraduate students affair and wellness, and has recently become the director of immunization with the Rowdy Faculty of Health Sciences. Um, so I welcome Amanda to come talk to us a little bit about the findings from the national survey. Awesome. Thanks, Mandy. Um, I'm really excited to be here. I apologize for not having been able to spend uh, more time with you all today because the conversation, the little 15 minutes that I caught here is amazing. So I apologize that I haven't been able to spend more time. I'm actually on call in Notre Dame today, uh, working in the hospital in the emergency department. So um, being a family doctor and fitting all of the things in in one day. Um, so I'm really excited to spend some time chatting about the findings of the R Care study from the national survey that was done as the first step of this study. Um, and I think it will be interesting uh, for us to ref or for you all to think about, you know, how this might, how you might respond to some of these questions when we think about how people across the country responded. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. And uh, Mandy or Jasmine, can you see my slides? Okay. Yes. Okay. Excellent. Um, and thank you for the introduction. Um, what I will say just in terms of additional details about myself is that I am currently practicing rurally in Notre Dame, but I did practice in Winnipeg for 13 years before that. So I have experience both working in Winnipeg and now outside of Winnipeg. Um, so to provide a little bit more background around our care, and I'm sure you've heard some of this today, um, but really this project is really looking to get have this type of conversation with everyday people across the country to talk about the future of primary care. Uh, primary care and family medicine are very hot topics right now, um, and so this project um, is really working to bring people together um, so that we can talk about how um, to shape the future of primary care in this time that is is really so important um, because things were certainly feeling the impact, I think, of some of the challenges in access to primary care. Um, and so lots of there's been lots of engagement um, around the conversation here um, over about 18 months and people have come together like this across the country and shared their priorities and hopes and things um, around how we might be able to make some change um, to the system to serve uh, people better across the country. Um, in particular, the project does pay attention to the needs and experiences of people who have historically been underserved by the system. Um, well, and so we've been purposefully looking for those views while also ensuring that the people that are participating are representative of the demographics or the makeup of the country. Um, so today we're in the first step of our Manitoba priority panel. Um, the national survey is the part that I'm going to talk about, and that was the first stage. Um, and then community roundtables are the third stage of the R Care project. Um, and we will have the opportunity to explore a couple of those community roundtables in Manitoba as well, so that we're getting that full experience of the project. Do you want to take a moment to thank the funders of the project? Um, there, there's been financial contributions from the Max Bell Foundation, even the odds, and from Health Canada. Um, and the views and things that we express here do not represent those of the funders. Um, but you can see all of the um, places that are supporting this project. Um, and we're very appreciative of the support so that we have been able to move this work forward, which is really so important. Um, so you, we're just going to talk a little bit about how the project has come together. So there are those collaborating organizations that we saw, um, and they're working and we're working together with primary care leaders. And then these provincial, um, we've developed provincial advisory groups um, of leaders in various 
parts of the system to help inform um, the creation of all of the um, workshops and events and things that you're going to get to experience throughout this project. Um, we can see here the provinces that have been participating. Um, and I think in Manitoba, um, I certainly feel very fortunate that we've had the opportunity to participate. Um, and I'm so looking forward to what we learn from all of you. Um, so as I said, I'm going to spend a little bit of time just reviewing um, the results of the national survey. So that first stage of the project, um, Dr. Kieran Tara, Tara is here with us as well. So if we do have questions, um, she's going to be able to help us help us answer them. Um, so the survey was open. This was an, uh, an electronic survey and it was done last year. So just about, well, almost about a year ago now, um, open for about a month, September 20th to the 25th. Um, there were a couple of ways that people were recruited into the study and more than 14,000 people responded to the survey. Um, at the end, we analyzed over 9,000 surveys. So there were 9,000 people who completed the survey and those were the ones that we analyzed. Um, and 69% of the people who completed the survey did so in English, and 28% completed the survey in French. Um, and then all of the survey responses were combined, and then we used um, census data to help us weight the responses in terms of gender, age, education, income, language, and region of the country that people who responded to the survey lived in. As with any survey, there are, of course, some limitations. Um, one of the things that we found from the study is that there were some groups that were underrepresented in the people who did respond to the survey. Um, and those include people who are new to Canada, people who are racialized, as well as Indigenous people. Um, the survey was only conducted in English and French um, and took about 15 minutes to complete and was only available on the internet. So obviously that does create some limitations in terms of how people would have been able to access the survey. Um, and so that might explain why we had, why we saw some of that underrepresentation in the groups that I talked about already. Um, people responded to the survey really just at one point in time, um, so that can absolutely influence how people answered the questions on the survey. Um, and with these types of surveys, it really, in addition to that, you know, snapshot in time, it really just gives us kind of a superficial answer. It doesn't allow us to really dig in and um, understand, you know, people's individual preferences or uh, why they may have answered a question in a particular way, and there isn't that back and forth. Um, so with all of those limitations in mind, um, that, that we'll keep that in mind as we look at the survey data. Um, you can go and look at the data yourself if you go to data.rcare.ca. Um, we have a selection of the questions and responses that we're going to review in this presentation, but all of the data is available um, and you can go onto the website to look at it for more information. Um, based on the um, data and the results of the survey, there were also a, a number of healthy debate um, articles that were written about some of, summarizing some of the data, um, and those may be of interest as well. And so you can also review those on the rcare.ca um, website on the slash media section, um, and then through healthydebate.ca, they have a summary, like they've summarized all the articles and put them, collated them all together on the, about the care project. Um, so the first section is we ask people about their experience with primary care. Um, and this is just sort of an infographic that summarizes um, a lot of the responses here. Um, I think one of the big takeaways here is that more than six and a half million people in Canada, adults, so people over the age of 18, don't have a regular family doctor or nurse practitioner. More than one in five adults in Canada. Um, and there is some variability um, in groups who have responded that way. Um, and across the country, we do see that geographic difference here. 
when I looked at these responses, it is interesting to see the difference um, in the people who live in Ontario and the prairies. Um, we see that 82 to 86 percent say that they do have a family doctor or nurse practitioner versus the 69 to 71 percent from the people who live in Quebec, BC or the Atlantic provinces. So there is a difference there. Um, we also see some difference in uh, where people's income levels are. Um, so people with a low who reported having a lower income um, had a slightly lower percentage, had a, a family doctor or nurse practitioner. A bit of a difference between men and women um, and a bit of and a difference between older people and younger people. So people between the ages of 18 and 29, only 63 percent said they had a family doctor or nurse practitioner. Um, and so this is a different way to look at that um, information where you see the breakdown um, across the uh, across the country. Um, I'm just going to jump in here. Did we talk about the Manitoba response to the survey already? No, we have not. Yeah. So one of the things is that the prairie provinces are grouped together in the responses on the survey. But overall, Manitoba um, had a relatively lower response rate. Um, so we, we aren't able to tease that out in these responses here. But that is one thing to keep in mind. Um, I think that also uh, really reinforces how valuable our conversation together is going to be because we are going to get that Manitoba experience um, in our conversations over the next couple months. Um, so one of the other things, so again, this is all along the theme of experience with primary care, um, is that we asked people, and so these are the people who said, yes, I have a family doctor or a nurse practitioner. We asked them if that person or somebody else in their practice would be available to help with urgent issues. And we asked this question um, along various days and times. This was really to get a sense of outside of regular um, office hours, how accessible were people after hours? Um, and you can see the responses here. 37% um, of people said that their provider or somebody in from their practice was not available to help them either before 9 a.m., after 5 p.m., or on a weekend. Um, and 27% of people didn't know the answer. Um, so they didn't know if someone was available in those times. Um, and so I think those numbers are important to highlight here. Um, I think the um, the Saturday or Sunday piece um, where 18 percent of people said that um, someone was available. Um, and then again, 24 percent after 5 p.m., at least one day a week. So we can interpret that um, at least one day a week may perhaps be a lowish um, benchmark. Um, OK. Um, so then we also asked people about when you first, again, this is the group of people um, who had primary care providers, um, when they tried to book an urgent appointment. So if you had something that you needed to be seen with, um, you know, urgently, um, how quickly were you able to get that appointment the first time that you called? Um, and you can see the colored responses here, um, which may be difficult to see on the Zoom. Um, I think the important part here is that only 35% of people were able to get an appointment the same day or the next day. Um, if you look at this green box here, um, this, this or green part of the circle, I guess, um, this is two weeks to one month. And this yellow square here, or the yellow part of the circle right here, um, respondents said it would take one month or more um, and then the orange part of the circle here said that they were never able to get an appointment. So again, this is somebody who has called because they feel like they have an urgent issue that needs to be addressed. So I think that this slide here really does highlight that um, um, there are some challenges with access for urgent things within primary care. Um, and we see on this slide here that those colored parts of the circle together um, are about 21% of the people who responded. Um, so then we wanted to look specifically at the people who said they did not have a family doctor. Um, so this is that greater than one in five people um, who are the six and a half million uh, Canadians who didn't have a family doctor. Um, 
about 12% of those people did report that they had another healthcare provider um, other than a family doctor or a nurse practitioner. Um, and so you can see here uh, the various responses um, and uh, the various professions or how they would describe the person that they usually talk to. Uh, you can see here 25% of people um, said that they had a specialist doctor um, and 30% um, here say that they were other. Um, I think the 25 percent with the specialist doctor is interesting um, because that would suggest that perhaps people have um, you know other medical things going on such that they're seeing a specialist um, and for me the question always is um, then who's attending to their primary care needs or their regular health needs if they're seeing a specialist so this was one thing that stood out for me on this slide um, again, this is that same group, the people who didn't have a regular family doctor or nurse practitioner. We asked them, well, what were the, the places if you, the last time you had something that you were worried about and it wasn't urgent, uh, where did you try and get care? And so we had a whole bunch of responses that people could answer here. Um, and the top three responses, half of the people, 50% said that they would see an in-person walk-in clinic. Um, 25 or 27 percent of people said a virtual walk-in clinic and 24 percent of people said a hospital emergency room um, and again this was a non-urgent issue but something that they were worried about um, so if we look at that 24 percent that are accessing the hospital emergency department again for me that is something that stands out as an interesting or an interesting response um, and I think something for us to think about in primary care um, I, off we could say that perhaps this highlights that gap in access to primary care. Um, we also asked people when, uh, so again, these are the people who don't have family doctors or nurse practitioners, when they had an issue, um, so when they had a health issue and they were seeking care, um, did they have to pay a fee? Um, to seek this care. And 21% of people did. Um, and then we asked them what the fee was for. So what was it that they had to pay for? 80% um, of those people said they had to pay for the appointment itself. 40% um, um, said medication or supplies. Um, and then you see forms and notes and things like that. Um, I think the appointment itself piece here is interesting. Um, and we can maybe talk a little bit more about why that might be that someone might have to pay a fee for an appointment. Okay, so of this group who didn't, we also asked questions around if people were looking to find a family doctor um, or a nurse practitioner. Um, and we so 29% of people who were looking, so if they answered, so yes, I am looking, are you currently looking? Um, that was to about 29% of people were actively looking. Um, and most of those people had been looking for less than two years. Um, and when we look at this side here, um, we the blue boxes on the graph here on the right um, are the people who already had a family doctor or a nurse practitioner. So you can see that most of the people who answered um, uh, didn't have one in this, if I'm reading this right. Yeah, yes. Do you, are you currently trying to find one? Yes. And most of those people here, 63% did not already have one. Um, it is interesting to note, though, that of the people who are looking for a nurse practitioner or a family doctor, 35% um, of them already had one. And so that is an interesting thing to think about, I think. Um, the other thing I think is good to note here is that almost one in five, so 17% of people who did not have a family doctor or a nurse practitioner were not looking for one. Um, and so we asked why. So why are you not trying to find a doctor or nurse practitioner at this time? Um, and again, I think the responses here are interesting. 35% um, of people say they're healthy and they don't need one. 28% um, of people, they're happy and can get with the care that they get from walk-in clinics. 30% um, of people say that there aren't any doctors or nurse practitioners accepting patients in their area. Um, while 21% of people said that they've been trying for a while and have essentially just kind of given up. Um, I think those sort of 50%, um, the responses of uh, the people who responded to those are also interesting because that again sort of reflects um, that perhaps the system doesn't have the access that people might want to primary care. 
Um, so then we asked also the people who said that they were trying to find a new family doctor or a nurse practitioner. We wanted to know why it was they were looking for one. Um, and so then you can see the um, responses here. Uh, really what does stand out, I think, is the 44% of people. These are the people who already have a family doctor or nurse practitioner. 44% um, of them say that they're not happy with the care my care provider provides. Um, I think this measure is really important for us to think about. Um, and I think listening to some of the uh, summaries of the values that came out, I think we can see some of this reflected um, in some of those responses of how um, the primary care system needs to attend to that experience that people have uh, within our care. Um, I think the 16% of the, the care provider closing their practice um, is also, uh, for me, important for us to think about, um, meaning that we, we need to ensure that we've got something to fill those gaps when people move or close their practice so that people don't fall through the cracks. Uh, we also asked respondents about what was important to them. So when they thought about um, the their uh, things that were important to them and the care that they received, what they valued most, these were the responses. Um, I think it's interesting for you all to look at these responses and think about um, things that you may have discussed already or other things along the way. Um, 98% of people who responded to the survey reported that they felt it was important that everyone have access to a family doctor, a nurse practitioner, or a team of health professionals that they can see regularly. Um, when, uh, based on the responses here on all of these, we are grouping the people who answered fairly and very important together. Um, when we ask people what they value most about that relationship with their family doctor or their nurse practitioner, 92% said that they like the fact that the, that the provider, the doctor or the nurse practitioner knows them as a person and considers all factors that affect their health. Um, we heard that in one of the groups, um, I'm sorry, I forget your name, but from Thompson with that turnover of the doctors where you don't have that relationship. So you see that the opposite, when the value of that reflected here. 91% um, of people felt it was important that they make it easy or they value that it's easy for them to get care during the day, um, that most of the care is able to be provided within, but you know, by their family doctor or nurse practitioner, 88% of people there. Um, that coordination piece um, from multiple places happens. That's a value that people appreciate as well. Um, and that advocacy or that standing up for you, 87%. Um, so I think useful to reflect on these these responses as well. Um, we asked about um, proximity um, and 88% of people felt it was important that their family doctor or nurse practitioner work close to their home um, so that it was easy for them to access that care close to where they lived. Um, I think also important based on some of the things that we talked about already um, with the values and things that you all have identified. Um, people also said they wanted better access to their own records. Um, so 75% of people reported that they wanted, they thought it was important that they're able to access their own health information online so that they could look it up themselves, essentially. Um, and 93% of people uh, reported that it was important to have one health record where all the health professionals can access them um, in the, that in the province can use. So there is less of that back and forth and, and um, going in um, back and forth for information. In Manitoba, and I'm not sure um, if we would have already covered this, but in Manitoba, we have sort of something like this um, with eChart, which is a provincial health record that holds a lot of information um, about people and that providers from across the province can access. Um, this is mostly like imaging tests, so x-ray reports or CT scans, blood work results, medications that have been dispensed, um, and your immunization record. Um, more information is being added into that record all the time. Um, it is a record that allows providers to look at the results, um, but they don't document anything in there. So it basically like pulls the information from other sources and then allows you to look at it. Um, so we, we do have a little bit sort of of that, um, and it's not 100% complete, but it is something. Um, 
So this is just getting at that question around um, people that really high rates, 97% believing that it's um, fairly or very important that every person living in Canada have a relationship with a family doctor, a nurse practitioner, or a team. Uh, we also ask questions around walking clinics and virtual care. Um, so 47% of the people who responded said um, in the last 12 months, at least once they had gotten care at a walk-in clinic. Um, this green box here um, is the never. Um, so people here didn't, these people didn't ever seek care in the last 12 months. This light green part of the circle here is six to 10 times um, in the last year. And even this light blue box is three to five times. Um, and then the dark blue is one to two. So even if we take, you know, these two colors together again, so, uh, you know, relatively large percentage of people who are getting care from a walk-in with some regularity. 77% um, 77, 77 of people got care at a walk-in clinic in person. 33% by phone and 12% by video and 5% with an online chat. Um, so you can see that the vast majority of appointments still are occurring in person. Um, we also asked people, those who did try to get care to walk in a clinic in the last 12 months, what the reason was um, for that visit. Um, and you can see the responses here, 26% unable to get an appointment, 28% um, unable to get an appointment as soon as they wanted, um, that 28% here who said they don't have a regular healthcare provider, 19% um, that the walk-in clinic was the most convenient option. Um, this response here kind of, um, again, sort of stands out to me as that, uh, that I have questions, you know, uh, most convenient. Um, are there ways that maybe that regular care provider, um, we could make that more convenient? Um, and, and that 33%, the walk-in clinic was the only place that I thought I could get the care from. So again, I think that's another one for us to think about. Um, we asked questions specifically about virtual care, um, obviously a really hot topic um, since COVID. Um, and interestingly, 71% of that virtual care, people who had experience with that was occurring by phone, 5% um, only by video and 18% by email or secure messaging. Um, again, that is another interesting thing for me. Um, when we often talk about virtual care, we tend to think about fancy things with video and things like like that, but sometimes it is often, it is just talking on the phone. Uh, we also asked some questions around uh, new kind of vir new virtual services where um, these are virtual walk-in clinics um, and the doctor that you or the provider that you talk to may not have access to your health records and may not be able to schedule a follow-up appointment in person. So it's a strictly virtual visit. Um, and you can see some of the responses that people had um, around um, their thoughts about those, um, how they would like to, or how they would feel about working with those types of services. 57% um, would not be willing to use those services if they were owned by a for-profit company. 70% um, were not willing to use the virtual services if they received payments or were owned by a pharmaceutical company. 78% um, were not willing to use the new virtual services if um, those services charged for things that you could get for free if you saw your regular provider or nurse practitioner. Um, and 84% would not be willing to use the services if the, your health data or their health data uh, was sold to pharmaceutical or insurance companies. So you can see some of the, the values coming out here. Uh, we also asked questions about virtual care with your family doctor. So different than um, with a walk-in clinic where you didn't have that relationship, this is more with the person that you, um, who already knows you. Um, we saw this on the previous slide, 71% of people had had um, communicated with the family doctor or nurse practitioner virtually, and again, mostly by phone. Um, we asked how people would... Um, what their preference would be. So how would you like to get care from your family physician or nurse practitioner? And in-person scheduled appointments are still the most, what people reported as the most important, 92%. Um, however, you know, telephone appointments, 66%. Um, and then we see that messaging, uh, the secure messaging and email video appointments popping up as well. Um, the 54% around that drop-in or walk-in person appointments, again, I think something uh, to think about in 
terms of how we um, uh, people are accessing care. Obviously, as people really value both the scheduled appointment and that walk-in ability as well. Uh, we asked about care in a team of health professionals. Um, and so most people's family doctors or nurse practitioners did not work with other professionals. Um, however, most people wanted them to. We did ask people who had a family doctor or a nurse practitioner who else worked in the same practice as the person that you see saw. Um, you see, most people had other family doctors that worked in their office. Um, a smaller percentage, 31% of people also worked with nurse practitioners um, and 36% had a nurse. And then you can see the other um, professionals quite a bit lower. Um, we asked about um, team-based care and what people thought about it. There's certainly a lot of talk about um, team-based care as really the kind of future of primary care. And so we wanted to know what people thought about that. Um, and 90% of respondents said they were comfortable getting care from another team member if it was recommended by their own family doctor or nurse practitioner. Um, and then we asked people what professions would be the most important to have as part of their team. And we see nurse practitioners high on the list, 75%. Um, and then nurses and pharmacists, psychologists, um, physiotherapists, and social workers at 23%. Um, and then we asked some questions about reimagining care. So what if we thought differently about how primary care was delivered and what were people's thoughts about that? Um, so we had asked questions around um, organizing the primary care system similar to how the public school system is organized in Canada, um, meaning that you know, with your move into a neighborhood, you get primary care in the same way that if you move to a neighborhood, your, your kid can go to kindergarten. Um, and Based on those questions, 72% of respondents agreed that teams of family doctors and nurse practitioners should be required to take a patient on or anyone who lives in their neighborhood. Um, and 66% of people agreed um, that people should be guaranteed a family doctor in their neighborhood, even if it meant that people would be encouraged to change providers when they move. So if you move from one community to another community, you would give up your family doctor in the community you were in and then get a new one in the uh, community you moved to. Um, so again, I think interesting to look at the um, responses here. Um, we asked asked some other questions around um, that um, different ways that the uh, teams and things like that might be made up. Um, people really preferred the option where they were able to have that relationship with one clinician. Um, and I think we heard that earlier in some of those values as well. 91% um, of people were willing to see one nurse practitioner for most of their care. 76% um, of people were willing to see any family doctor or nurse practitioner in a group practice where the records were shared, even if you didn't see the same person consistently. Um, and 65% of people were willing to choose from a list of available people um, close to their home instead of being able to choose anyone in the province. Um, so I'm going to stop there um, and I'm going to stop sharing and we'll open it up to questions um, and we'll go from there.